In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to come into the presence of the Lord, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and look to the only source that we have to be cleansed and thus qualified to be able to even come into his presence. O holy and gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you this day, and some of our sins we know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which we are ashamed, but some are known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask forgiveness. Please deliver and restore us that we might have peace. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has sent his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. To those that believe in his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and he bestows on them his Holy Spirit. The one that, is believe, that one that believes and is baptized shall be saved. O oh, grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We prepare to uh, celebrate a great uh, festival the week before Easter, the high point of the uh, Christian year. And uh, historically, it was a week before Jesus uh, rose again from the dead that he entered into Jerusalem and it was a triumphal entry. He was received by so many of the common people as the very Messiah of God, uh, King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who had been promised from of old. And, uh, often in our churches, we have celebrated that. And uh, sometimes we can have even little children go down the aisle of a church with palm branches and waving them and uh, trying to uh, recapture something of the moment uh, in a, a pictorial way of what it was that uh, happened when Jesus entered into Jerusalem so many years ago. However, liturgically, there has been a move by some who uh, are somewhat persuasive in trying to say, well, this, is, this was a great day and it's certainly worthy of being talked about, but maybe just before Easter, Maybe the thing that ought to be certainly uh, covered in a, a very much more spectacular way is the passion of Jesus. Um, it's the way that Jesus took away our sins. I had a very spiritual experience in seeing the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that was produced by Mel Gibson. Uh, for as many years as I have studied the Bible intently, found that I had never at one moment given the kind of intense uh, thought about something I could read in a couple of seconds, but that obviously was uh, very compacted into a few words to talk about something that was uh, just gruesome and something that I needed to ponder, or at least I was indeed blessed by pondering. As, that, uh, as I can read very quickly that Jesus was scourged, the film didn't cover that in just that um, one or two seconds that you uh, would look to uh, say that even slowly and dramatically. No, it uh, very much depicted what Jesus went, underwent for me, for you. And uh, it was powerful from that perspective. So it is that this has been renamed Passion Sunday. And usually the many of the churches uh, have a, a longer gospel reading. Uh, sometimes it's two chapters, sometimes three chapters out of the Bible that deal with this, uh, well, arguably one of the most important things that Jesus did in his human ministry, again, for you and for me. Um, and so uh, this Psalm, is the psalm that is covered. I didn't even want to try to take on the long gospel reading, uh, but
But this, this psalm, Psalm 118, uh, covers a little bit of, well, what's there for Palm Sunday and also for Passion Sunday, especially in two of its great verses, and uh, is quoted for that reason. Uh, we find in verse, uh, We find in verse 22, the word, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Wow. That's a significant uh, thing that uh, is quoted many times in the scripture. That uh, certainly gets us to the passion of Jesus. And we also uh, have the word that was said in connection with Palm Sunday, uh, where we have in verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, indeed, that's the words that were said as Jesus rode into Jerusalem and how appropriate he came in the name of the Lord. Well, this psalm is a, a great psalm. That's one that has a interesting literary device called inclusio and uh, as I re have read the text, uh, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. That's the closing verse of the text. And it's also the opening verse of Psalm 118. Well, let me read this great uh, Psalm, Psalm 118, again, verses 19 through 29, which are the uh, appointed uh, words uh, for uh, this particular Sunday uh, as far as the psalmody. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. This is a great uh, psalm, a, a victory hymn of sorts. And there's been speculation as to what is the original setting of the psalm. Uh, some have suggested that it might have been especially composed for the events that are described in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, which is uh, dealing with the... Uh, rededication of the temple, the temple that had to be rebuilt in uh, that uh, time of the biblical era. Others have suggested that it might be a psalm that deals with a Israelite hero that uh, had been discounted and thought to be somebody that, oh, this is somebody that uh, really isn't going to be worth giving any kind of hope to be able to do anything significant, as somebody who had the opportunity and rose to the occasion and was used by God to bring about a great deliverance and to be an exceptional hero. This is what Bible scholars would call uh, typology. Uh, we thank God for many of the bits of messianic prophecy that we find in the uh, Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, it 
is important so that people can identify Jesus as the one and only Messiah, the one who came to fulfill the promises of God and that we can have confidence that there will not be another uh, and he is the one that uh, is um, the one of promise, the one who is the great deliverer. Uh, many of these messianic prophets are very detailed. We find a lot of them, for instance, in Isaiah 52 and 53 that deal specifically uh, with the uh, crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and uh, some people have even called Isaiah the fifth evangelist because of the detail that he has in that prophecy, in the prophecy of the virgin birth from Isaiah 7, and in the a prophecy that we find uh, that is uh, particularly known to us via the uh, great uh, musical piece of Handel's Messiah, all that uh, to be found and more in uh, the book of Isaiah uh, as just one of the great places of Messianic prophecy. But there's also biblical typology. And the Bible itself will refer to uh, Isaac as a type of Christ, somebody that uh, was put up to be offered, okay, as a sacrifice uh, and to uh, be one that uh, made things, again, right with God. Well, I suppose if there is typology in the Old Testament that is in accord with Jesus' words to the Pharisees, uh, when he said, you search the scriptures because you believe that in them you have eternal life, they are they which testify of me. Well, uh, with biblical typology, we can see Jesus is in so many parts of the Old Testament that, uh, that they're are so many things that just point directly to him if one will but let the Holy Spirit uh, work in them to be able to see them, to take uh, otherwise the blinders off of their eyes. And yet, in our day, one might even speculate as to whether, well, you and I can in some way be New Testament typology for people uh, the name that we bear, Christian, it means little Christ. It's a diminutive form, and it was meant originally to be an insult. It was something that uh, people thought, oh, you little Christ, you. And well, the early Christian community said, well, if you mean to insult us with that, please insult us some more. For if you see anything of Jesus in us, it's the highest compliment you can give us and it's inspirational to us to be about well, what the Holy Spirit can work in us to point people to the truth, the only truth that sets people free. And uh, so as the body of Christ, uh, hopefully people can see something of the power of God to transform lives in and through the Lord Jesus. Um, how does this psalm start? It starts with verse 19. And even before the beginning of this part of the uh, pericope, the uh, little um, um, bite-sized piece of scripture that can be read on a Sunday morning, there is a description in this psalm of a, uh, a time of being surrounded, a, a time of being uh, well, put in a spot where they uh, have people that feel that they're hemmed in by an enemy. My enemy's all around me. And yet, we find that there's already a uh, verse that uh, precedes our pericope that talks, well, I will not die. I will surely live. Uh, it, it's, it's a significant thing because you remember that Jesus makes the statement uh, uh, as he uh, raises Lazarus from the dead that he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Uh, of course, he's not talking about that we won't physically die here upon the earth, but that our spirit will not die. 
There's an interesting contrast there is that those who reject God, who go their own way, they suffer eternal death. It doesn't mean that they're wiped out of existence, but they suffer the kind of existence that isn't really living. Uh, and yet, for those of us that, uh, again, have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and his rich forgiveness, we have eternal life. Ah, what a beautiful thing. And so, to the psalm itself, as it's found in this week's uh, pericope, Psalm 119, beginning with verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Yeah. Uh, the picture of a gate or a door is a big one in the scripture. The uh, ancient cities had to be uh, oh, used almost like some of us that watch uh, old-time westerns find that they uh, have the stockade, have the, the fort that uh, people gather in when there's uh, a big uprising and there's uh, a need to, to find protection. Uh, some of you remember the um, movie that uh, dealt with the uh, whole uh, pageantry of the Alamo, uh, where, okay, well, we have to stay behind these walls in order to, to make a, a big stand. And uh, at least for a period of time, it held off the enemy. Uh, gates then at that point would have to be closed. Now, interestingly enough, in the book of Revelation, we find that heaven really won't have any gates. And yet, in another sense, there is a gate. In the Gospel of John, we have many of Jesus' great I am statements. And one of them is, I am the door, the door to the sheepfold. Uh, this is an important one uh, in terms of our understanding, the proper understanding of Scripture. The figure is not in the word am. It is not that Jesus represents a door, because if that were true, what's the real door that Jesus represents? No, the figure is in the word door itself. Okay, well, Jesus functions as a door. Uh, and just as in a sheepfold, the shepherd, well, he would be there and he'd have a nice hedged in kind of thing that he could put the sheep in. And the opening to that uh, protective area was a place where he slept, okay? And well, that's where the phrase comes, over my dead body. Any kind of uh, thing like a bear or a wolf or anything that wanted to, to uh, come and to um, do terrible things to the sheep, well, uh, the only way that they get to those sheep would be over the dead body of the shepherd who was guarding at the door. And no sheep would get out. He was in the doorway. They couldn't get over him. No animal was going to get in except if they were able to overcome the shepherd. And the shepherd would be harmed in various ways to be able to ward off uh, would-be attackers. Jesus, Jesus is the door to heaven. He's the only way. We're told in the scripture that the way into heaven is through the straight and narrow path. Well, there are people that go this way or go that way, and I uh, say they, if they don't find the one way into heaven, well, remember when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the straight and narrow way. He is the door. And well, we implore him, please open, open the gates of righteousness. Well, we have in verse 21, I thank you that you've answered me and have become my salvation. Uh, some people will translate instead of that, I thank you that you have heard me uh, from the original Hebrew. And uh, that's an interesting thing is that uh, I have a lot of empathy for that translation because it stresses the fact that uh, it's a privilege even to be heard by God. Uh, in fact, it's really a blessing that the way that God answers is not necessarily always with a yes. 
Uh, Jesus got turned down once in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when he said, well, God, if there's a plan B, let's exercise it, you know. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And Jesus humbled himself before the Lord. Uh, certainly we rejoice when our prayers are answered. We don't want to be victim to uh, what we're exhorted in the scripture to not find that we have not because we ask not. Yet on the other hand, we can understand the, the wisdom of uh, even a uh, thing articulated by a, a modern day country singer like Garth Brooks as a thank God for unanswered prayer. Uh, remember once the illustration was given of the little baby and we're like little babies before the Lord. And he says, okay, uh, baby looks and wants to grab that shiny object. And that's what he wants to possess. But the mother sees, oh, that shiny object is a knife. Okay, a knife that uh, maybe you see me using to open a letter or whatever. But uh, here, little baby, let me give you a rattle instead. That'll be safe and something that'll really be a blessing to you. We want to leave the answers to our prayers to God. Uh, some of the things that we ask for wouldn't be the ideal. We have to use God's wisdom and God's timing and appreciate that. That's when we come to the great verse, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. As quoted at least three times in the New Testament, it's quoted uh, as something that Jesus quotes from the Old Testament in Matthew 21, verse 42. It impressed St. Peter so much that he includes it in his sermon that is recorded in Acts 4, uh, verses 8 through 12, and again in his first epistle, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. And it's an important one because when Jesus came, he was rejected by the people that should have been in the best place to have accepted him, by the leadership of the covenant people. Many of the common people, they recognize this, this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. But the leadership, they, they didn't want to disturb the status quo. Uh, they had their own uh, positions of uh, honor and the like, and it just seemed like Jesus would come and cause them to lose some of their stature. It's almost as if they thought, huh, wouldn't you know it? Of all the times for the Messiah to come, just when I'm in a good position in Judaism and I, I've been, I don't know, because they sort of uh, diminished by his coming because that's where all the attention needs to go. Well, he was the stone that was rejected and yet he was the most important one. Uh, maybe we see something of this in the uh, Christmas uh, story about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Okay, he you know, uh, had all the other reindeer make fun of him, but then, oh, okay, they all rejoiced when he was the one that led them on that foggy night, and otherwise they would have been unable to accomplish their mission. Well, Jesus, of course, is much <laughs> greater than a silly little song about a reindeer, but the, the concept is there. Jesus comes, and uh, nobody sees in him uh, what they should have seen. This is something that we want to be able to appreciate. Uh, uh, some weeks ago, we dealt with the truth from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and that is when uh, God says clearly that uh, it was by his wisdom that the wisdom of the world wasn't going to be uh, the way that people came to know the truth that would set them free that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. And indeed, the folly of the cross, the thing that uh, Paul preached and uh, along with all the other apostles, that is where salvation lies. Um, we're told that this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And indeed, that's what a place like Corinthians uh, affirms and what the messianic prophecies 
that we find in places like Isaiah put forth. We do want to rejoice in the special day that God has given us, a day of salvation, a day of victory, when everything was looking like, well, all is lost. No, Jesus saves the day. And so we rejoice in that. And indeed, blessed he is, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We're reminded in scripture that there are those that uh, came in their own name. And uh, this is alluded to, for instance, in John 5, well, uh, said, well, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Well, Jesus came in the name of the Father, came in the name of the triune God, not just in his own name. Jesus humbled himself, and we are called to follow his example. This is a great thing about Jesus. He never asks us to do something that he isn't ready to do himself. So we rejoice in these things. When we're told about the light, that he made his light to shine in us, well, Jesus is the light of the world, and then we're told that his body, the body of Christ, now is the light of the world. We rejoice in that. And with the horns of the altar, well, we bind the festal sacrifice. There we're to sacrifice ourselves and our lives. As it's been well said, uh, we're asked to give up what we cannot keep so that we can have what we otherwise could not possess. And in all this, we are to give thanks to God, to extol him, give thanks to God for he is good and his steadfast love lasts forever. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, we we thank you that Jesus came and uh, he, he patiently humbled himself in order to accomplish the uh, way of salvation for us. Uh, he did what we could not do ourselves. Now you give us an opportunity to, in some uh, small way at least, to reflect some of that light. Uh, Jesus is the sun, the S-O-N, who uh, is the source of light. And you know, just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so well, we can reflect the light of the S-O-N, uh, the, the sun, uh, because um, he has given us his Holy Spirit and the opportunity to be able to serve. Help us, Lord, as we uh, face difficulties in this world to realize that um, we do have the final victory that you promise us and that it will be sure. We may seem to be people that are rejected, uh, as in the text that uh, we looked at today, the, uh, the one uh, that represented all truth was rejected by sinful mankind. Um, let us glory in the fact that because of you, we have a victory that cannot be taken away from us uh, as we continue to put our faith and trust in you and uh, that our victory is assured. To you be all glory and honor through that Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be and abide with us all. Amen.